Good evening. By way of introduction, my name is Nora Tukridi, and I'm a student at Sydney Law School. I'm very humbled to have been invited to welcome you all this evening. Thank you to each and every one of you for attending tonight's event. We are very pleased to welcome Sydney Law School alumna, Her Excellency, the Honourable Margaret Beasley, Governor of New South Wales. Before we commence, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather this evening, the Gadigal peoples of the Eora Nation. I pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. And I also extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here with us today. The Distinguished Alumni Series is presented by Sydney Law School in conjunction with the Sydney University Law Society, an organisation that aims to enrich the personal and professional growth of law students through social events, educational support, competitions and initiatives that inspire students to use the law as an instrument for social change. I would like to express my sincere appreciation to everyone who has generously helped to make tonight possible. Special thanks to Professor Simon Bronnett, the Dean of Sydney Law School, and Associate Professor Penelope Crosley, Director of Alumni Engagement, who is not here with us today. I would also like to introduce Sydney Law School alumna, Nicole Abadie. After a 20 year career in the law, practicing as a barrister at the New South Wales Bar, and then teaching international law, Nicole moved into the literary world and now writes about books and other things for Good Weekend. Nicole was one of many extremely fortunate women, barristers to be mentored by Her Excellency whilst at the New South Wales Bar. Since Ada Evans became the first woman in Australia to graduate in law 120 years ago, many other trailblazing women at the University of Sydney have followed in her footsteps. In 2022, we celebrate all our women in law from those who paved the way to the change makers of the future. So without further ado, let us welcome Miss Nicole Abadie in conversation with Her Excellency, the Honourable Margaret Beasley. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Nora. Welcome to this evening's event, which as Nora has said, is part of the Distinguished Alumni Series presented by the Law School in conjunction with the Sydney Uni Law Society. It is my very, very great privilege to be here tonight in conversation with Her Excellency, the Honourable Margaret Beasley, ACKC, Governor of New South Wales. Before we begin, I too would like to acknowledge the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respect to their elders past and present. The Governor probably doesn't need too much of an introduction, but I'm going to give you one anyway. Her Excellency studied law at the Sydney Law School from 1970 until 1974, when she graduated with honours. In March 1975, she went to the bar, where she read with Murray Tobias QC, as he then was. She took silk in 1989. She served on the Equal Opportunity Tribunal as an Assistant Commissioner to ICAC and as an Acting Judge of the District Court. Before, in 1993, the inevitable happened and she was appointed to the Federal Court of Australia, the first woman to sit exclusively in that court. In 1994 to 1995, she was a consultant to the Australian Law Reform Commission's reference on gender bias in the law. In 1996, she was appointed to the New South Wales Court of Appeal, the first female member of that court. In 2006, she received an Order of Australia for services to the judiciary and the law. In 2008, this law school conferred an honorary Doctor of Laws on her. In 2013, she was appointed as President of the New South Wales Court of Appeal. And in May 2019, she ended that role when she became the 39th Governor of New South Wales. In 2019 also, she was awarded a Doctor of, a Doctor of Laws by the Australian Catholic University and the University of Notre Dame. And finally, though it's not really a finally, there's a lot more I could say, in 2020, she was, it's described as promoted to Companion of the Order of Australia for eminent service to the people of New South Wales, particularly through leadership roles in the judiciary and, and this one's close to my heart and we're going to return to it, as a mentor of young women lawyers. Your Excellency, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Nicole. So, the conversation is going to follow a fairly chronological thread. So I'm going to start with your early life. 
You grew up in Hurstville, the middle child of your parents, Gordon and Lorna's five children. You have two sisters and two brothers. And something that you wanted to highlight, and I do as well, is that your mother was highly intelligent, winning prizes at primary school. But because of her circumstances, she had to leave school at 13. She was very keen for her girls to get an education. And she was very keen for you to go to the school that you went to for your final two years, Mount St. Joseph in Milpera. You have described the years that you spent at that school, those final two years, as life-changing. And I'd like you just to tell us a little bit about your experiences at that school. It was interesting uh, because I didn't want to go there. So it was rather interesting that I came out of it saying that it was one of the most extraordinary experiences of my life. And it was all due to my mother. Uh, educated she was not, but determined she was. And I could say when she, to say she was educated to until age 13, it was the day of her 13th birthday uh, because that's the way it was. It was during the Depression. Uh, many people couldn't afford an education. That was the uh, minimum age at which you could leave school. And the story coming out of my mother's life was that uh, you went from primary school, grade six, into the first year of, of high school. Uh, you sat down the back of the class, but most of the girls did, uh, because it was just a time of great poverty. And as each child turned 13, they left the classroom and didn't come back. So when you think of it, you just have uh, this group of uh, women, but not only women, men as well. My father didn't have much more of an education, uh, who extraordinarily intelligent people, but who didn't have much more than a primary school education, and that was our country in the uh, 1930s, you know, leading up to the uh, Second World War. We hear of many of these stories from overseas countries, but it was our story as well. Mm. Uh, but my parents were extraordinarily literate, not in the sense that they were literary, uh, but they, they were very literate. Uh, but for them, it was the, the newspapers, the daily news. That's where they continued to keep uh, their vibrancy, their modernity, and their quickness of thinking, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. And as I said, my mother was um, very determined that I was going to go to Mount St. Joseph because of the, uh, that particular order of nuns who, who uh, taught there. I was particularly keen to go to St. George Bells High. I'd gone to, uh, I'd been educated by the Sisters of St. Joseph up to year 10, and I wanted to go to St. George Girls High, uh, mostly to do languages, and in particular, Indonesia. I saw Indonesia as being Australia's future. Mm. We're still trying it's to very find- very prescient of Yes, <laughs> it's taken Australia a long time to get around to realising that, and uh, they taught Indonesian uh, mm. at, that, uh, at that school. Anyway, uh, I, thought I'd prevail upon my father in this particular family argument. And his response was, um, I think you better talk to your mother. <laughs> and her view was, I, uh, she was very attached to the Sisters of St. Joseph. She had an auntie. It wasn't a real auntie, it was a family auntie, if I can put it in those terms, who was a Sister of St. Joseph. Their ethos was to provide the best education possible to the children uh, in families who couldn't afford uh, a fancy education and hence it was that I caught a bus, a train and a bus to school wow. every day uh, during my last two years of school and travelled from Hurstville to Milpera. And there was an ethos in that school which was very particular, hard to put my finger on it and indeed one of my favourite teachers there, Sister Stanislaus, otherwise known, we were very irreverent and she was Stan to us and stand behind her back. And she, she said to me, so I kept in touch with her, uh, that th there was a spirit in that school that she had not experienced in any other school. So there was an ethos that was coming there. And it was an ethos about the education of young women. Mm. It was an ethos which said um, young women, and you've got to remember this is, I have to confess, 1968 and 1969 when it was still, uh, women were still only tiptoeing into the professions. But there was an ethos where 
you're at that school and you could do whatever you wanted mm. uh, in your life, in your career. And it, it was a, just a fantastically uh, open environment, an open learning environment, but I think more particularly an open thinking environment. And if, if I would put anything on that, bearing in mind it was a Catholic school, uh, it was about the time, it, it was post-ecumenical council, but uh, in a Catholic school, to be able to have the freedom of thought that we had was really, uh, as I said, it, it was life-changing. Mm. I was interested to read, Your Excellency, in an interview you've given before, that you didn't decide to do law until right at the end of Year 12. And you said, not many women did law in those days, so it wasn't an obvious career path. And I wondered, what was it that made you decide to study law? I know we've talked about the fact that you did some debating in those last two years and you enjoyed it. That, did you know any lawyers or where did it come from, this desire to be a lawyer? I was a working class kid who didn't know lawyers, uh, that's for sure. In some ways it was a process of elimination. I, I made a number of assumptions about myself. Uh, one of those assumptions was that I would go to university. That meant that I had to get the marks to go to university, but I did do well academically. And as I said, you know, we were in an atmosphere where it was assumed that you would go to university, that you would do the uh, courses that you wanted to do. Uh, medicine was a possibility, but in my, those last two years, I actually had a timetable choice. I couldn't do the levels English history that I wanted to do and also do the same level maths and science that I wanted to do. So I actually had to make a timetable choice as to which one I gave priority to. And I thought about it and I thought, you know, I just really love history, I really love English. So I went that way and I thought, well, if I decide to do medicine, again, making that extraordinary assumption that I would get into medicine, uh, I would um, just simply do a short course and which would sort of you know, pick up my maths and science, which would enable me to do it. So like I said, a certain amount of naive, um, <laughs> a certain number of naive assumptions that I was making. But looking at it from the humanities side, I, I, I didn't want to teach. I didn't, uh, I thought about doing economics, but did I really want to be a banker? Because what else did it, economists do? I didn't really know. And somehow or other law just filtered up and I've just been very fortunate that I chose a career uh, that suited me and it seems that I suited it as well. And you can't be much more fortunate than that, it seems to me. So you did straight law, which was then a four-year degree, starting in 1970. You graduated in 1974. You were one of about only 25 women in your year. And I wondered, especially for the benefit of the young people here who might be students here at the moment, if you could tell us a bit about how you enjoyed your time here at the law school, what your favourite subjects were, maybe some of your favourite lecturers, just some little memories about your experience here at the law school. It wasn't actually an experience here. Oh my, sorry. <laughs> uh, philosophically I, I here. Here. <laughs> it, was, um, it was an underground experience yes. uh, because the uh, old law school, which is probably better described as the intermediate law school, uh, the lecture theatres were all underground. Uh, that to me seemed to be extraordinarily novel. You know, you, it was quite amazing. And Deprived there was a, the students of light. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> no. But I, look, I just, in some ways I was out of my depth because I was straight from school. I had no sort of real experience. For the most part, there was only a handful of us who were doing straight law. Everybody else had done uh, arts law for the most part. And, uh, you know, we were sort of these naive group of half a dozen or so lawyers straight from school. And they, for the most part, they were the people that we piled up with, I piled up with immediately. But then my friendships, of course, developed much more broadly. We spent an enormous amount of time drinking coffee in the, um, <laughs> in the common room, which did have light. That was on the fourth floor. That was the mm. first floor mm. which had light. And the... The, the connection, it was also, I think, a new phase of teaching. Um, we, we had uh, young, full-time uh, lecturers, whereas the tradition had been for the lecturers, for the most part, to be 
uh, practitioners, mm. for the most part barristers, who would come in after after court. We still there were still a few of those, but for the most part they were sort of new full time lecturers who gave all their life to the students. Uh, many had just come back from uh, Harvard in particular, and you know were sort of teaching the Socratic method. Mm. Uh, again, somewhat new than just sort of talking to a, a lecture theatre full of students. Uh, Bob Austin was one of those, and uh, it will be wonderful to uh, give him his uh, Order of Australia uh, this, this year, which will be wonderful. Uh, today, I actually invested uh, Peter Gerangelos uh, with his Order of Australia, which was absolutely wonderful for me, for the law school. I mean, such an amazing constitutional lawyer. And here I was, a student, you know, sort of many years ago, not his student, but still a student in law school. I was not enamoured of my constitutional law professor, I have to say. And I'd uh, like you to tell us the reason why that is. I was going to say, although it was the 1970s, they weren't all as evolved as you might hope that they would be. Well, some <laughs> hadn't evolved at all. <laughs> but the constitutional law lecturer who called you something that you've told us about? He called us all girly. You know, you, you were girly, girly. What do you think about this? Uh, I think I might have had the same constitutional law lecture, but I, I think he'd stopped calling people girly by then. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, fortunately, I won't mention his name. You know, I could sort of give him a posthumous award for something. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and defamation uh, law doesn't run. I do appreciate that. But, I mean, everyone does have a reputation to protect, I assume. But yeah, you were girly. And uh, it was really quite extraordinary. And I remember one particular conversation I picked up on as I was coming into the lecture theatre one day when he said to one of my fellow students, male, uh, what are they all doing here? And the male student said, oh, I suppose they're all looking for a husband. <laughs> Which we weren't. <laughs> also said, I, I read somewhere else that you said when you that you first encountered that sort of attitude at, at a, the first post-HSC party where someone said to you, what are you doing going to law school? You're taking a man's place. No, it took his place. Oh, it took his place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my very first, you know, like, and, you know, those days were a little more sort of restrained than what they are today. So going to a party was a big thing mm. sort of straight after, straight after school. And, uh, yes, uh, there was a young man there who uh, didn't get into law and I had taken his place so far as he was concerned. So let's go to the next stage of your career, and that's as a barrister from 1975 through to 1993. So you went to the bar in 1975. You were only 23. It was almost as soon as you'd left university. You did, I think, pass through a law firm for about a month, and then you went straight to the bar. And I was wondering, during those four years of studying law, did you form a view very quickly that you wanted to be a barrister, that that was the path within the law that you wanted to follow? And if so, why? Oh, I think I knew uh, when I made up my mind to do law that I wanted to be a barrister. It wouldn't surprise anyone to know that I like talking. Uh, I, won't, I won't say holding court. <laughs> uh, because, you know, being a barrister involves a great more skill, a uh, great more nuance uh, than just holding court. Uh, you need a sort of very sort of uh, very analytical mind and you know there's a there's an expression as you're in court you need to be able to roll with the punches as the argument develops and as the judges are being difficult with you you need to be able to handle all of that but there was just something about uh, being able to I, I, I guess present the argument which I really really loved and I was quite incredulous to read 1975 which really wasn't all that long ago there were only six women barristers who were practising in New South Wales at that time. And as you said to me, there were a few more on the roll, but there were only six of them practising, four of whom were doing family law. And we're going to come back to that in a moment. But I wanted you just to tell us a little bit about what it was like for you in those early years, being one of only six women. And I thought I'd ask you to start with the bar jacket story. <laughs> well... You would think that if you had the right to uh, work, as we did, and right to work in a particular trade or profession, 
you ought to be able to fairly easily acquire what I will describe as the uniform for that profession. And of course, you know, being a barrister, it's a uh, bar jacket, uh, either sort of wing collar and, and, and or a jabot, the gown and the wig. Well, the gown wasn't too hard to get. The wig, you could buy at great expense. I can show you at 23. Uh, but I was told uh, that, you know, you just ring up David Jones and you make an appointment for uh, a fitting for your bar jacket. So I rang David Jones and I asked to be put through to the bar jacket department and this very English, he sounded English to me anyway, uh, but I perhaps, perhaps that's almost a derogatory statement. He, let's just say he sounded very pompous because not every English person is pompous as we know. <laughs> and I said, oh, uh, he said, yes, how could I help you? And I said, oh, look, I'd, uh, I want to make an appointment, you know, for a fitting for a bar jacket. Oh, uh, yes, um, well, send him down. And I said, uh, look, I think I'll come down myself, if that's all right. He said, oh, oh, no, sorry, madam. We don't make bar jackets for women. So I've, I've realised over the years that there's a sort of... A, um, a sort of a, a silent protester yes. inside of me. But sometimes I think the pro, you know, protest can be good, but sometimes silent protest can be very, very powerful. So I never wore a bar <laughs> jacket. And you know, no one, no one noticed. No, no, one, nobody noticed. No, no, none of the judges leaned forward and said, I can't see you, no, Miss Beasley. No, no. But so they're, all, they're all short I mean, short sighted and deaf, I think, is the way it goes. <laughs> I'm sorry, Judge. <laughs> Not sure at all. <laughs> Some of the other stories you tell are about applying for chambers and being told we've got nothing against women. It's just that we already have one. <laughs> I mean, really, I, I read that story and I wasn't sure if that was a joke or not, but I guess it wasn't. Oh, that was, that was the, uh, the good, good response. <laughs> Most of the response was, um, oh, we don't have women here. I just go around the corner and I get those chambers around there, which were considered not quite so uh, prestigious. Uh, but uh, you just knock on the doors and, and they just wouldn't have you there at all. So I wonder, and you also tell stories of briefs being withdrawn when the client learned that the solicitor had briefed a woman as a barrister. And I wondered, trying to put myself in your shoes, I, I came 20, or 20 odd years later, how did that feel? How did it feel to be discriminated against in that way? And how did you deal with that? I talked about the silent protest. There's also the silent anger. <laughs> uh, what do you do? Mm. Uh, you know, the brief is gone. I must say in that particular case, uh, a, uh, the, the solicitor was very embarrassed. Mm. Uh, it was the partner who had uh, withdrawn the brief. Uh, but I had other occasions. I had another occasion, for example, I was on circuit, we'd, we'd settled a matter and there was an argument about cost, as there almost always is, and I got instructions from the solicitor that I was able to do a particular deal on costs. And when the partner heard about it, he was, I mean, he just ripped me to shreds, and yet I had acted on instructions. Uh, it seemed that the solicitor must have, should have been the one who was acted, uh, should have been if anyone, no one course. should have been ripped to shreds. He'd, he'd got instructions from his client. But that was just the way it was. I love something that you've said about this in answer to that question, how did the discrimination feel? You, you've said once before, I'm sure gender was a barrier, but my approach was to go ahead and do it regardless. And then you've said, I talk to a lot of young women in these terms and I say, be a doer. Do what you want to do. I wondered if you wanted to expand a bit on that vice. I guess you don't really need to. That just seems to be a um, very appropriate response, I think, yes. to just get on and do your job as well as you can. And I think that is, I still think that is very important advice and I'll, I'll put it into context in a moment. But if, if you don't keep on doing it, because, you know, there really was that, every, everyone has a hard time at the bar. Uh, everyone has difficult uh, cases. Everyone has a difficult solicitor who is not always pleased with, with what your performance or what you've done. So everyone has it. But in those days, if you're a female, it was really quite difficult. And the most difficult, one of the most difficult parts of 
aspects of it at that time was getting the type of work that you wanted to mm. do because there was um, the assumption that the only work that you were capable of doing was family law, mm. an extraordinarily important part of um, law for our community, but not the law that I wanted to do. And it wasn't law that I enjoyed doing And either. what did you want to do? I really wanted to do commercial law. Mm. Mm. Commercial and you law. did. You ended up building a brilliant career doing what you wanted to do, commercial work, equity work, administrative law work. That's right. How did you do it? I dropped off family law. Mm. You, just, I, did you, you just said you weren't practising in that right. area. I just walked back from court one day and I thought, <coughs> I am not doing this anymore. Mm. And I just said I wouldn't take any more briefs. And uh, life rolled on, fortunately, for me. But if I can go back to, uh, you know, the discussion about sort of women doing it, when uh, many years ago, uh, the Women Lawyers Association, who spent some very valuable time uh, promoting the cause of women and some time which was not so, so valuable because sometimes it kept the focus on the discrimination rather than promoting, you know, sort of the very clever and competent women in the profession. And so I used to very strongly, you know, argue or, or discuss with them that what you should be putting your hand up for is, you know, if you want to do tax work, if that's your specialty, you put up your hand for every tax seminar and to do a presentation at every tax mm. seminar that you can find, or whether it be uh, commercial law or administrative mm. law or whatever. In other words, you be out there showing your skill and showing your competence because you can talk about uh, discrimination and disadvantage uh, till the you know, proverbial cows come home, but people have to see you doing it. There is a great deal at the bar in particular about visibility. Mm. And you've got to be vis visible as a practitioner. And I think you have to be visible as um, a practitioner, competent practitioner in a particular discipline within the law. Mm. One, of the down one of the many downsides of there not being many other women at the bar, as you've talked about, the fact that it was difficult to make female friends because there were so few of you. But you did form, I know, a special friendship with the late Jane, the Honourable Jane Matthews. She was the first female judge of the District Court and then the first female judge of the Supreme Court. I wondered if you'd like to talk a little bit about that relationship and how important it was to you. It was a relationship. Also a graduate of this school, law school, yes, I believe. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Uh, it was a relationship which came about perhaps coincidentally. Uh, you know, you just go to a number of functions and, and she would be there and for some reason or other we did become extraordinarily close friends and she <coughs> was the godmother of my, of my first child, of my, of my daughter. So, you know, that is a very, very special relationship. And she was the person that I turned to when I was offered the mm. position on the federal court uh, because for a judge anyway... Uh, to be a judge, I was still quite young and... 41. 41, yes. And and I'd only been silk for three years. And, you know, do you... And I think at that time I was on bar council, I would have... I'm still making these assumptions about myself. I think I would have been president of, mm. of the bar council. You worked your way course. up through that home. Yes, if I'd, if I'd sort of stayed. And, and they, they were... Uh, you know, achievements which would, would have been, I, I suppose, appropriate. But you're offered the court. I had three very young children. Uh, three I, under six. I was uh, getting extraordinarily busy at the bar and I'm thinking, did I really have children to work seven days a week when, you know, uh, it's not bad to spend a bit of time with your children somewhere along the way. And in fact, you know, that family life is extraordinarily important. So, but I did turn to Jane because I was very, very uncertain as to whether you know, uh, to do so or not. In fact, my, my clerk said to me afterwards when I, I, I had agreed to accept the appointment, he said, I didn't think you were going to do it, you know. So I really was that uncertain. Jane's view at the time was uh, I had no choice. <laughs> She just thought as a female, uh, we really had no choice but to 
uh, put ourselves, I guess, in those, you can call them leadership positions if you like, but or to accept those leadership uh, positions and to be a role model for those, uh, for other women in the profession. So she was very firm about that. Interestingly, when I was offered the Court of Appeal three years later, I turned to her again and I said, Jane, what am I going to do? And she said, it's your choice, Margie. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jane. I thought you were my friend, you know. Uh, but then it really was the choice of, I suppose, the type of work that you were going to do and uh, whether you were going to be moving yourself into work that you really wanted to do. And that was, I suppose, the decision almost going back to the time when I had to choose between, you know, the math science and, and the humanities, and, and the humanities mm. side. You know, what is it that's going to really suit you as an individual? I want to go back to the mentoring just for a moment because I want to emphasise something that Nora said in the introduction that I'm, I'm really grateful for her making this point, that I was one of the lucky... Uh, I won't say a handful of women barristers because you mentored a whole lot of young women barristers and I wanted to thank you for that publicly but also to ask you to talk a little bit about how important that mentoring role is, particularly in a profession that's male-dominated, for the senior women to mentor the more junior ones. <laughs> Look, it's fundamental. I mean, it's absolutely fundamental. I mean, with Jane, I, I would say it was a friendship, but within friendship there is... It's not called formal mentoring, but it's the person you can mm. go to mm. when you really have these very important decisions to make in, in your life. And uh, again, if I speak of Jane, it's a generosity of spirit. That's mentoring mm. at, sort of at its most basic mm. is about a generosity of spirit. And you know, for you to share your experience it may not be the experience of the person that you're speaking to, but at least it allows them to have something uh, to bounce, bounce off against mm. so that they can make their decisions for themselves in, in that way. You hope there might be a little bit of wisdom uh, caught up in it as well, but uh, it, it, I think that's really what it's about. And if, if we don't, if we aren't generous in what we do, who is going to be generous after all? I always said there were two kinds of women at the bar, I won't name any of them, but there were those for whom it had been very difficult, like Her Excellency, who thought I'll make it easier for the ones coming up, and there were others who thought it was very difficult for me and it can be just as hard for her. So Her Excellency always fell into the first category. I wondered, was it, as you had hoped it would be, easier to combine the roles of parent and judge than it was as parent and barrister? Look, I think the answer is probably yes, and, and almost undoubtedly yes, because uh, as a judge, your life is quite structured. Uh, whereas as a barrister, you know, if you haven't worked out the answer to that case, by the time you're on your feet at 10 a.m. the following morning, my goodness, you shouldn't be there. Uh, so if that means, you know, working into the early hours or getting up at 5 a.m. Uh, to work it through, that's just what you have to do. So there is that constant pressure as a judge, you don't. You, you should be. You should have understand what the case is about. You should have read the papers, but you don't have that sort of critical uh, decision making aspect and, and the analysis that you've got to put forward at that time. And so, from that point of view, it is much more structured. You've also got to remember that, as a um, uh, you know, the way our profession uh, operates in Australia, we have that uh, January period off. You do as a barrister as well, but as a judge, you also had four weeks variable mm. leave during the year, which often as a barrister, you didn't mm. take. Uh, you didn't give yourself that luxury. So uh, it, it was, I, I think that combination of the structure and the time uh, enabled, it, it was easier. So for example, you know, with my little boy, uh, well, with all of the kids, I could, uh, drive them to school without myself being anxious mm. about the argument that I had to present in half an hour or an hour's time. Mm. It meant when my little boy was... Those things matter. Oh, those, they really do Those matter. things matter, the driving yeah. to school. Yes. It matters. Yeah. Uh, you know, with uh, my little boy, when he sort of was in kindergarten, I could stay in the playground mm. until the kids went into school and I wouldn't be into chambers until 
30, for example. Which I would have fine. been up from yeah. 5 a.m., I have to tell you, and working, you know, from 5 to 7.30 or so a.m., uh, but you, you could do that and it was much, much easier. So I wondered about the change in work from the move from the Federal Court to the Court of Appeal. Of course, in the Federal Court, you sit as a trial judge and as a judge of appeal. You, you move between the two. I wondered how, when you moved to the New South Wales Court of Appeal, in 1996, how you enjoyed that new role of doing appellate work only? When I took Silk, I, gosh, I don't think I've ever put myself into a position like I am at the moment, having made so many assumptions about what I could do. <laughs> but I had also made up my mind uh, when I took Silk that I really wanted to uh, develop an appellate practice uh, as a as a female practice doing a fair bit of knockabout law, mostly as a junior, mostly uh, on my feet, on my own, uh, which gave me extraordinary experience and extraordinarily wide experience. But I just made up my mind, I really wanted to be an appellate advocate. And so when I was offered the position on the Court of Appeal, in some ways that had just, uh, mm. it was, the other side of the coin, not an appellate advocate, but an appellate judge. So I enjoyed it immensely. And then, of course, you were became the president of the Court of Appeal in 2013. The first woman president. You remained in that role for six years until you became the governor in 2019. But uh, something else that you said in one of the interviews I read was that unlike your early years at the bar, I was really interested in this. She said you didn't experience any sexism from your fellow judges and you put that down in part to the fact that you were all paid the same. You said when equal pay is part of the package, it becomes part of the ethos. Money has a power aspect to it that you can't ignore. And I thought that was really interesting. I wondered if you wanted to talk a bit about that. I think it's exactly the way I feel and it's one of the things that I now... Uh, you know, speak out on. I think that equal pay is extraordinarily uh, important. And, but I think it also goes further than that. Uh, I think in positions of leadership and particularly as women, we have to uh, recognise that in female dominated uh, professions, the pay tends to be lower. And so I think we need to advocate for better pay uh, in the what I'll call the caring professions. I raised that this year at uh, an, uh, an event for uh, International Women's Day. And there was a panel of women, highly, highly accomplished women, who were speaking about what they had done within their organisations to promote women. And that's extraordinarily important. But I put up my hand and I said, but we, just as I've said just then, we can't ignore those women who are lowly paid uh, in the professions which are most also very important in our community. And one of the panellists sort of got onto that point very quickly and she said, yes, it starts telling us what we as a, how we as a society value the caring professions, value care. And I thought that was very important and I, thought that, and I think that's a very significant message. And uh, so I'm an advocate for equal pay and I'm an advocate for much more, uh, much better pay and pay that really reflects the, the value of those who look after us uh, in the community. Now, I can't resist asking you to retell a story that you told at your retirement ceremony, but I'm hoping that a lot of people here won't have heard it. You said that you didn't experience any sexism, but there is a story that I'd like you to share with us. You got wind when you joined the Court of Appeal in 1996 as the first woman it came to your attention that one of the senior male judges didn't like women wearing pants. So what did you do? What I say about a silent protest? Although if you can call a red suit, a red trouser suit, a silent protest, <laughs> I'm not sure. And you wouldn't believe it. you know. At your first judges meeting? Absolute first judges meeting. A bright red pantsuit. And I wore <laughs> it in and I thought, I'll see what he says. And guess what? <laughs> Not a word? Not a word. And I 
I've, I've kept that pantsuit, you know, just for the sake of it. And I do have to tell Wait, you... Can I tell you, young lawyers all over Sydney who heard that speech are starting to wear red pantsuits. And in fact, I read of one um, young woman who, went to in, who came to interview and she wrote in the interview that <laughs> she deliberately went out and bought a red pantsuit to wear to come and interview you. So they'll be cropping up all over Sydney, those red pantsuits. And can I tell you, the journalist, Catherine Fox, uh, I invested her today with her Order of Australia and guess what she wore? A red pantsuit and it. we had a conversation about it. And as she said, it's... Uh, Love it. it yeah. But it's it's really, made me think a little bit of Hillary Clinton and the travelling pantsuits. They always talked about her with the travelling yes, pantsuits. Yes. But that, that experience was really much of the experience of my time at the bar. There were just, and I, I do have to say this, and not terribly respectfully, to a great number of men, not everybody, because at the end of the day I got chambers. And I got chambers because a man saw me do an appearance of all things uh, in the matrimonial causes division, which was the precursor to the family court. And, you know, so there were men there who really did uh, support you. But there were, as I've said, many men who just sort of... Um, uh, resisted you simply because you're a female. And what I really objected to about all of that is that these people were making assumptions that they had the right to determine your role, mm. what you could do. And limit it, not just to determine, but to limit it. To, yes, to limit it as well. And I never appreciated that, if I could put it in those terms. Yeah. And in some ways... It was the same when you had someone saying, well, you can only wear this or you can only wear that. You know, I mean, there is appropriate dress, there's no doubt about that, but uh, to actually determine whether it can be pants or not pants, you know, blue shoes or red shoes, mm. I don't think so. Let's move now to your time as governor. And I was wondering how you felt when you received that call, I think it was on a Sunday in January 2019, asking you to become the governor, the 39th governor of New South Wales. Was that a difficult decision? Well, it's, it's, it's a bit extraordinary. <laughs> I mean, I go out for a Sunday walk. I come home. Mobile rings. It's got um, no ID, you know, that, yes. you know that message? And you think, oh. In those days, it's only three and a half years ago, I have to say, uh, there weren't so many, um, you know, sort of spam calls as, as you get now. I tend not to answer a call if I, if I don't recognise the number. And I thought, oh, it's a bit strange on a Sunday morning. And I answered it. And it was the Premier, Gladys Berejiklian. And the Premier was a very efficient woman. She expected an answer. On the spot. <laughs> on the spot. On the, on, on the phone call. In the phone call. <laughs> and... We had a, um, a, then an arrangement to have a, uh, an actual formal meeting on the Tuesday, which I thought was going to be it. I had, she said that her staff would be in touch on the Monday and they had asked for my CV. By the time I arrived on the Tuesday, the CV had already gone to Buckingham Palace. Um, the only hiccup with that is that it went to the wrong door in Buckingham Palace. <laughs> so it took a little longer to come through than... Uh, uh, and I wasn't prepared to actually believe it until I had been informed that the, uh, Her Majesty had signed the commission. I'm glad that you mentioned her because that was my next question. So there are, the Governor, of course, is the formal Head of State in New South Wales with three major roles, constitutional, ceremonial and community. I'd like you just... I know that you're not at liberty to disclose what was said, but just I've heard you speak of the occasion you were fortunate enough this year in June to meet Her Majesty at Buckingham Palace. And you tell a lovely story about that, about what she'd been doing that morning. Well, her opening salvo, I have to tell you, uh, was that our Prime Minister, as Charles had told her, and that's a quote, Charles told me this morning that your Prime Minister isn't attending Chogham. Well, oh, this is a good opening <laughs> to, a, to an audience with Her Majesty. She was not amused. Well, she's able to keep a certain sort of countenance, uh, which is probably quite good for all of us to emulate, you know. But uh, she'd been out horse riding that morning, 
and she is extraordinary. And we had a 40 minute audience, which I'm told was unusual. Uh, unusually some, long. Unusually yeah. long. Yeah. And I thought she was gonna live to 110, I have to tell you. Uh, her walking, she did have a walking stick, but it was over the chair, she wasn't using it. The conversation flowed very, very easily. She's got a very cheeky sense of humour. Uh, for example, her second salvo at us was that uh, she said, oh, she said, you know, I put one of my horses uh, into Ascot yesterday. She said, I was sure it was going to win. She said, my horse only had to go 250 yards. She said, yours had to come <laughs> across the sea. <laughs> and she figured she had a pretty good chance. Uh, uh, so she talked about her um, horses. Uh, we talked about uh, the state of the world. Uh, different people. She had very sharp views on, and very acute and very astute views on various individuals who sort of remain sort of in the news at the moment. Uh, really quite wonderful. She did tell me, she reminded me that uh, when she visited Australia in 1954, uh, in, in February, she said, oh, that garden party, it was so hot. I've never been so <laughs> hot in all my life. So she had all those memories, all those sort of, uh, and, and wonderful connections and it was, I did not have the feeling that I was speaking to a frail woman. I certainly was speaking to an older person, but not frail in any way, shape or form. And so it, it was, you know, to me quite a shock and, and quite upsetting, uh, you know, to hear that, that she had died and, and died so quickly, but wonderful that she died so peacefully, obviously, as we would wish for everybody. Yeah. Your Excellency, I've had the, the benefit of looking at a lot of the speeches that you've given over the last few years. And what struck me more than anything else was the, the diversity of subject matter and the depth of learning in these speeches. So just, I, I mean, I encourage all of you, a lot of these speeches are, are on the Governor's website, but the topics that you have spoken on, and I'm, I've only selected a few, but they include First Nations people, women in government, the Vietnam War, sexual assault and consent, the Me Too movement, the right to vote, modern slavery, social justice, the pandemic, and this was the most incredible to me, the International Space Treaty Regime. There are five treaties that govern international uh, space, in case any of you are wondering. In your speeches, and you give about four or five a week, you draw on the law, you draw on literature, you draw on the latest social science research on history, even cricket statistics in one of them, and I wondered, after 45 years in the law, how much are you enjoying the opportunity to educate yourself and your audiences about such a broad range of topics? I did rap once. Oh, I've seen that. You did. <laughs> <laughs> it was I amazing. I should have mentioned that, yes. yes. I, was, um, I was giving a speech on that occasion. Uh, it was for the reception that we had at the end of the Sydney Festival for those involved in the Sydney Festival. And so it just seemed to me that it was very much an after party. And so I sort of went, you know, tinkering around the internet about after parties. And of course, there's a film called The After Party, which is all about a rap singer. And so I thought, I can't talk about a film about an after party where the principal actor, subject is a rap singer without doing it, can I? And so <laughs> I was quite proud of that so performance, actually. So the speech begins with a little bit of rap. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and it sort of took the audience, particularly my staff, a little bit of a moment to think, what's she doing? <laughs> She's doing rap. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. <laughs> but look, the, the view I took uh, and, and the view I take uh, with speeches is, is twofold. First of all, uh, as, as a judge, as a lawyer, but particularly as a judge, it was my role to apply the law. It seems to me in this role uh, as governor, I, I have that legal skill uh, or a legal skill. And I do think that there is a role of the governor to be able to inform the community of the law mm. and uh, inform the community of important issues uh, in the law. Modern slavery, for example, mm. uh, was, is, is one. I also take the view uh, in my speeches that you sh and it doesn't matter whether really it's a five-minute speech or a 25-minute speech. 
a speech really should be able to do one of two things. It should either inform people of something that they didn't know or it should make them think about something mm. in a way that they hadn't thought before. Mm. And so for that reason, I do put quite a lot of time, quite a lot of research mm. into my speeches mm. to hopefully achieve those objectives. I have one final question, and it was something really beautiful that you said that I wanted to ask you about. A speech that you gave in 2020, I've heard you describe your role in the way that you just did, and that, that's also obviously a really lovely way to describe the role of governor, but this one really appealed to me, and I think it will to all of you. You described your role as governor as follows, to see society as it is, and to encourage and promote the society to which we collectively aspire. I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about that. There is a, a way of describing the role of governor, which is you know, summed up as the three C's, constitutional, ceremonial and community. Constitutional, of course, is the core. You wouldn't be there uh, if it wasn't for that. Uh, it's, it's part of the constitution, the New South Wales constitution, and it's a very important, well, fundamental constitutional role. It goes without saying. The ceremonial is very important and, you know, I said once uh, we were laying a wreath in a, in a country town, there was a uh, Vietnam veterans uh, group that we were meeting with and just in conversation as we were walking over to the morning tea, I said to this particular veteran, I said, you know, in, in this role these days I, I lay a lot of wreaths but I, I said there's never an occasion when I don't feel deeply affected by it, never having laid a wreath before in my life, before I became governor, and particularly no involvement with the military, with the defence forces before then, I said, but there's never one occasion when I don't feel affected by it. And this is a man who had fought in Vietnam, you have to remember, and he said, I'm glad you feel that way. And it suddenly made me think how deeply our community feels um, about uh, their service, uh, what they have done, uh, what is important to them, and very significantly, and I feel this then if I take that into the community role, how important it is for members of the community to feel valued. Mm. And I, I think that's the thing that I, I, I take away mm. most. And so when I talk about uh, the community as we see it is, there are so many wonderful aspects of our community. There are so many needy aspects of our community, so many giving aspects of our community. That's, that's the community we are, and you want to continue to encourage people to make this community really the community we want to live in. And I think the very special privilege one has as governor is that you don't have a political agenda. You, you are the governor for the government of the day, regardless uh, of, of what party is in power at the time. And so you can go into every corner of the state, every community in the state, and you are there because of that community. You are not there because, to put it you know, quite bluntly, and this is the role of a politician, not only to look after the constituent, but to get the vote of the constituent. Mm. That's not your role as governor. And that's a real privilege to go into a community uh, because that community, that aspect of community is very important. You can talk to them, you can listen to them. Sometimes you can link people in community to other sections of the community, but more often than not, it's that simple thing that by being there, mm. people feel valued. Mm. You do wonder why, you say, gosh, you know, I'm just an individual like anybody else. But for members of the community, you are a person in authority. Mm. And to be recognised by a person in authority is very significant. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. <laughs>